Okay, so uh, gorgeous ones, my talk is called How to Stick to Low Carb. So the first thing I'd like to know is who in the audience here has nailed their low carb lifestyle and are completely happy with the way they're doing it? <laughs> Great, okay. All right, so who, has, who finds that they dip in and out of it a bit and have trouble making, getting consistency? Right, okay, well, I'll be talking to you today. Excellent. Okay, so um, I thought I'll just start. Now, I know a lot of you know me, but maybe some of you don't. Um, I, I'll start with my credentials, and of course, I have a, a big conflict, and I want to make that very clear. But obviously, my name is Lucy Burns. I'm a, a GP originally. Uh, I retrained in lifestyle medicine. Uh, sadly, belong to a, veg a, a vegan college called the Australasian Society of Lifestyle Medicine. I threw their nutrition component in the bin, but the rest of it is pretty good. Uh, I have some uh, training in psychological medicine and I'm accredited for focused psychological strategies and I'm a member of the, Australia, of the Australian Society of Psychological Medicine and I have a certificate in medical hypnosis which I love. I am intensely interested in metabolic health and the psychological factors that affect health. Now my conflict is that I'm a co-director with gorgeous Dr Mary of Real Life Medicine and uh, we do create online holistic health and weight loss programs that, of course, use low carb nutrition. Uh, I don't have many photos of me. In fact, I had to fossick around for this old one because I have curated my old photos. The, all the fat photos went in the bin and that was the only one I could find. Uh, I began my journey five years ago, and like most of us as clinicians, we came to low carb because we were looking for solutions for our own health. I was a binge eater, very much all or nothing, perfect on a diet, the queen of dieting, or on a bender, eating everything in sight until the next diet would come. So embarrassing, people would always be asking me, are you on a diet this week? And it's like, ugh. <laughs> Absolute sugar addict, used food for everything, very much love-hate relationship with Maltesers <laughs> and red, uh, those white raspberry bullets. <laughs> uh, this is Mary and me. Uh, and as I said, we run the 12-week mind-body rebalance. Now there's, I think, I mean, I've met a few of you already. Who's, do, who's done the 12-week mind-body rebalance? Oh, goody, gorgeous ones. Make sure you come up and say hello to me if I haven't already said hello. Uh, I know some of you are doing it now. And look, we, Mary and I just love people. It's sort of weird. Um, <laughs> anyway, so my talk's called How to Stick to Low Carb, so I thought I'd better look up how, what stick to means. I mean, it's not rocket science, but it did come up with this idea of to continue doing something despite difficulties. And I thought, yeah, well, that's exactly right. That is exactly right. So the difficulties that people have, now these are genuine difficulties and what happens is that people will get cross with themselves and say they're just making excuses. And so they'll go, I'm just doing, I don't know why I'm making all these excuses. They're not. They're actual difficulties that your brain finds. And so for some people, it's not enough time. You know, they're working too hard. Then when they actually have time, they're on holidays. And so then they're on holidays and that becomes hard. Uh, they might be catering for many fam, you know, many members don't want to cook four or five dinners. Or they've just got one person and it feels like it's not really worth it just cooking for one person. Some people find it boring. Some people find there's too, much, too many low carb snacks. Some people say it's too strict and other people say they need a meal plan. Some people's difficulties are eating out and some people find particularly eating with friends difficult Coming to conferences that are not low carb can be difficult. Fun people find traveling difficult, aeroplane food. Some people have trouble after dinner snacking, special occasions, or a very common one is the partner that sort of just trots out their, their ice cream every night. <laughs> <laughs> so, as I said, these are genuine difficulties. And if I wanted to give you a talk just on this, I could write an action plan for you. This is what we would call action-based solutions. And if I was writing an article for Body and Soul magazine who wanted to know the top seven tips to stick to your low-carb diet, this is probably what I'd give them. Keep it simple. 
builder plate. You've actually got your builder plate formula in your books there, but it's really simple. It's basically pick a protein, add some veggies, add some fat if the protein's lean, add some salt and flavor. That's it. I'd tell people do online shopping so you don't have to run the gauntlet of chocolate things at the end of each aisle. I'd say to people, you know, consider meal planning. That'll make decision fatigue much better. Uh, think about emergency foods for when you're starving or hungry or, or craving. Try some low carb products. Do some low carb swaps. Drink plenty of water because that's always in the end of every single health and wellness article. But the problem is you already know this. Like this is, again, it's not rocket science. I haven't just suddenly come up with a thing where you go, oh, online grocery, I've never thought of that. You already know all of this. So that's not actually the difficulties. The difficulties come down to two main things. So one is what we call emotional eating, and I know you all know that, but that can be stress eating, boredom eating, lonely eating, and reward eating. There's probably a few I've left off, but they would be the main four players. And who here? relates to any of those yeah good yes exactly you're human and why do we do that because food makes us feel better as James alluded to earlier the food all food all food gives us dopamine but the ultra processed food is dopamine on steroids it's massive so real food has a lot of trouble competing with processed food for the dopamine hit. It was hardwired into our survival mechanism to, for food to make us feel good. Because humans may have just laid around waiting for food to come and it wouldn't have. So they, they whoever they is, whoever invented us, uh, invented this dopamine system. <coughs> food makes us feel good. Oh good, I'll go and get it. Because remember, back in the olden days, not that very long ago, it was quite hard to get food. So there had to be another mechanism. The other thing that stops people sticking, if you like, to their low-carb diet or their low-carb lifestyle is fear, fear of judgment. And again, not another diet again. God, what crazy plan she on now? Okay, or fear of standing out where you're the one eating the big pile of meat and everyone's going, oh my God, what's, what's Joan doing? Okay, or the fear of missing out when you're surrounded by all of these hyperpalatable processed products and you're sitting there and your brain's yelling at you, what are you going to do? For a lot of people, it's fear of being difficult. You know, they don't want to be, they don't want to be that person. And so they just kind of go with the flow. And why would we do that? Because if we're different, it's a very strong uh, driver of fear in us as humans because we're tribal. So if you're different to your herd, you're at risk of being ostracized. And again, in our modern society, not such a big problem, but back on the plains of Africa, if you were kicked out of your herd, you died. Humans are not very robust. Fear of failure. Okay, for a lot of people, if you've tried and you haven't succeeded, your brain just will tell you it's never gonna work. It's not gonna happen for you. It happens for everyone else, but I'm something wrong with me. I won't be able to do it. And interestingly, fear of success. And that's a, a often trauma-based thing where people, when you live in a bigger body, you're a little less visible. You can hide a bit. You're a little less attractive is what your brain is saying. And so it keeps you safe. We have people who are scared of restriction. And there is a big movement at the moment that is telling people don't restrict because you'll binge. And there's actually no evidence of that. I haven't got that in my talk because I was just been recently researching this because I'm thinking this is everywhere now. Don't restrict or else you'll binge. Everything in moderation is essentially what it is and it's rubbish. And then fear of the future and what that is is when your brain says to you, how am I ever going to live without bread for the rest of my life? <laughs> It's a really big, so it's a story that pops up and because that feels impossible, we don't do it for the moment. So for lots of us, change can make you feel unsafe and it makes you feel scared to either start or to go again. The one thing that we do know is it's not hunger that is stopping you sticking to your low carb lifestyle. This is in complete contrast 
to calorie restricted diets, 20 points at Weight Watchers used to leave me starving. So if it's not hunger, so it's not your physiology, what is it? Of course, our beautiful, beautiful brain. So our brains have a default setting that has kept us alive and surviving as the human race. And that essentially is humans move away from pain and we lean into pleasure. Hmm. It's kind of a pretty good idea, really. So that kept us safe from uh, things that were dangerous, that were often painful. And of course, as I said, got us foraging and hunting for food, which was pleasurable. Mm. At its crux, the brain's job is to keep us safe and make us feel better. The biggest block though, the feel better we can kind of get past, the biggest block I see for people is the fear. These three would be the top three. Fear of failure, again, humans are pattern, our brains are pattern machines. We look on past experiences to predict future experiences. So if you have failed, and whatever failure means to you, if you've done that in the past, your brain will use that narrative to predict what is likely to happen in the future unless you consciously and repetitively change that narrative. The fear of missing out is, again, that's probably the hardest one for people to manage. And part of it is, is the thought process, which I'm going to talk a bit more about, is really that this is deprivation. They're white knuckling their way through it. White knuckling willpower, whatever word you want to use, doesn't work. It works in brief spurts, but it is not a sustainable uh, technique. And then the last one is just fear that it's not going to work. What if I do all of this? What if I put in all this hard work and nothing happens? And again, we talk a lot in our various programs about um, transactional relationships. So again, dieting is transactional. I will do this very hard, boring diet for eight weeks, but I'm going to lose eight kilos because that's what they told me. That becomes our mindset. And so then if we perhaps are using the scales as our yardstick and it stops working, we get scared. We do an exercise in the 12-week Mind Body Rebalance, and some of you will have done it. We call it the hero's journey. And we get people to really drill down onto their biggest block, which we call the dragon. What is your dragon? And you know, initially people will go, oh, my dragon is uh, takeaway food or something like that. But at the end of it, when we get further and further and further down, it is one of these three things. So what do we do for this? Well, CBT, K is the uh, well-regarded psychological technique uh, that uses something called the thought model. So this is what we base most of our coaching on. And it is this concept that your thoughts create your feelings, which drive your actions, which determine your results. It can take a little while to get your head around it at first. One of the things, so we talk a little bit about brain. Now, this is a very simplified version for my 20 minute talk. Uh, there are people who spend decades studying the brain but I'm gonna to talk to you about three parts that we talk a fair bit about. One's called the pre prefrontal cortex. So that's the front part of our human brain. It is the part that makes our brain big. The prefrontal cortex is why our brain is bigger than dog's brains and cat's brains. It's our really big thinking component. It's very clever. It, we call it the parent brain, <laughs> but it is, it's the rational bit. It does all the analytical thinking, it, it's logical. It does impulse control. It's the conscious bit of your brain. It's a bit of the brain that makes you dental appointments even though you don't want to go. <laughs> the next bit of our brain is in the middle here and that's called the limbic system and it's comprised of three bits. So the amygdala, hippocampus and the nucleus accumbens. Now, the amygdala's job is it's like a warning system. It's part of our keeping us safe. And for lots of people, and uh, Shannon referred earlier to people with trauma, but for people with trauma, their amygdala is easily activated. And people these days are referring it to as being triggered. But it is on higher alert, because remember, past experience predicts future experience. Except if you're a super fund, apparently. Um, <laughs> so what we want to do is recognize that that's what's happening. 
The hippoca- uh, the nucleus accumbens, I kind of like saying that, uh, that's the dopamine bit of the brain. That's the bit where all the dopamine gathers around and makes us feel good. And then the hippocampus is in the middle and the hippocampus is the memory bit. So it's a bit that remembers. It remembers what made us feel threatened. It remembers what made us feel good. And look, we call this little bit of the brain the toddler brain. And part of the reason we do this is that it, it, it really, if you imagine a toddler having a meltdown, and in fact, uh, I saw a reel yesterday that somebody had sent me, which I just couldn't quite embed into this talk in time, but it was basically this two-year-old standing in the kitchen and he's crying and there's some cake and he wants cake and the mum says, it's dinner time. And so the mum's the parent brain, the toddler just loses his mind. I want cake, I want cake. Anyway, she's filming, it was very cute. And basically, that's what our amygdala brain will do. Uh, so the, it, it's super interesting and learning to manage that toddler brain is part of what will help keep you on track. Then the last bit is uh, the reticular activating system. Now it's in our brain stem, just this bit down here, and it's actually the filter of our brain. So when we, we have our parent brain, so the prefrontal cortex will have a thought and it'll be thinking about something. And then, oh, sorry, we've got so much information that comes into our brain. Can you imagine every single thing we see, hear, do, feel, touch is a stimulus. It's truckloads of information, but our brain filters it. And it decides what's important based on this reticular activating system, which is why when people say, you know, again, the classic will be that, you know, if you're looking for a new car and you decide you want a red Mazda, you are going to see red Mazdas everywhere. You have never seen them before, but suddenly they're there and it's not like they just appeared. It's just that you've become more aware of them. Previously, you filtered them out. It's a really important part to understand with our brain because it reaffirms our underlying belief system and our underlying beliefs are not always that helpful for us. So coming back to why you have trouble sticking to your low carb lifestyle, it's your brain. It's trying to keep you safe and make you feel better. Like it's doing its job. It's just that it's not actually what you want to do at the moment and that it sometimes gets the signals wrong. What you are not though, you're not weak. You're not undisciplined. You're not useless. What you need is tools to understand how that brain works. We need to work with our brain and not just beat it down, hoping that that will be helpful. For many people, they've never been taught the skills. Now, interestingly, kids these days get so much more emotional literacy and emotional education than we did. In fact, people old, a bit older than me, they, their childhood experience was children are seen and not heard. Their childhood experience was that you don't, you don't even matter. So no emotional literacy. Boys were told never cry, be brave. Girls were told be ladylike, keep your legs crossed, all that stuff. Nobody was ever given tools to actually understand how their brain works. So it's absolutely not your fault. But I always say to people, it is your responsibility because no one's going to come and do it for you. So the tools that you need, again, you need some cognitive reframing, which is really just coming up with different ways to change the way your brain is thinking. Learning how to emotionally regulate so that you're not just using food as your one tool to soothe. We use something called goal, achieve, goal achieving, which is a tiny bit wanky, but it's just like goal setting, except that we want you to, goal setting without actually meeting the goals is unhelpful. So you have to do goal achieving. And if you do little ones, small goals that you then acknowledge, you build trust with yourself. Because remember, for lots of you, you just keep thinking, I can't do it, I'm hopeless, I can string a couple of days together and then I cave. And then, of course, this is why we're all here, as part of a community because then you can talk to other people about what you're doing. You can get strategies from other people. You can get tips. You can do all of those things. But this is what happens to most of us when we stop doing the thing that we want to do. We hide, OK? You go, oh my god. And you feel embarrassed, and you feel ashamed, and you've told people, and now you're it. So then we hide. So then sometimes we, get, then we, then we hide the food, because you know, it's shameful to eat. And we just hope somehow that it'll stop, that we'll just magically find our button to turn the switch back on. Or other people berate themselves. 
Okay, we've talked a lot about this. You're useless, you're hopeless, I can't believe you can't do it, you never stick to anything. Now, you tell me, do these work? No, <laughs> no, otherwise you'd all be doing it. But they're the tools that you've been using, yeah? And they just don't work. So we just need to go that we need different tools. Okay, you need to understand what are the stories? What are the stories that are in there? And can you change them to a story that serves you? So what I mean by that, I read a book by this guy called Chris Helder, and it's a tiny little book. Um, and it's called The Useful Belief. So the useful belief is this idea that you can change what your underlying belief structure is. So for people that believe they can't live their life without bread, and I know they might be using that euphemistically, but if you say it enough, it becomes this really big thing. I couldn't live without it in my life. In fact, who, uh, it was Jonathan who mentioned the, the lady who didn't want to stop drinking. Life's not worth living without alcohol. It's interesting. So that in her mind is a fact. It's not actually a fact. It's her opinion or it's her belief system. You can change it. So my belief system used to be that life wouldn't be worth living without Maltesers. <laughs> Yeah, interesting. And that, that belief system did not work out that well for me uh, because it meant that, you know, Maltesers, they're everywhere. You can buy them in every petrol station, every supermarket, you can order them, like they're everywhere. Um, every vending machine always has Maltesers. So I realised that what would happen was that my Malteser desire was never satisfied, never. Whether it was one Malteser or a hundred, I always wanted more. So then I heard that phrase, one is too many and a thousand is never enough. And it was like, ah, oh, that's me, that's me. As soon as I have one, I just want the whole packet. As soon as I have one packet, I just want another packet. The only thing that stops is actually if there was no supply and unfortunately there is, unlike a Zempic, there is plenty of <laughs> Maltesers. So changing that story, and it took a go, it took a few goes, you know, the first time I heard it, I thought oh, that could be helpful. I, had to, I repeated it over and over and over because our prefrontal cortex remember is full of thoughts and thoughts are just a connection between two nerve cells and when we first hear that connection it's like like a thin tiny bit of like gossamer just thinnest thinnest thing and unless we repeat that it, it just breaks and you forget it okay which is why we all don't remember everything we've ever read Okay, we have to repeat it, and you repeat it over and over, and then that gossamer turns into maybe a little bit of, you know, string, then into a bit of wool, then into a steel cable. And now that is my default. One is too many, a thousand is never enough. It's not. The, in my brain, I know the amount of whatever it is, willpower, to have none is much less than the amount of willpower to stop it too. It's like, okay, because my brain will say, and I'm sure yours does this too, just have a little bit, a little bit will be fine. You'll be fine. You have a little bit and walk away. <laughs> Again, has not worked out for me for 45 years. Not going to work out now. But what happens is I have that little bit and then I've got to renegotiate the whole thing. Chit chat, chit chat, chit chat. It's exhausting. So coming up with a story that serves me was so much better. Now the feelings, okay, so this is everyone's talked about, we, you know, eat to soothe, eat to feel better. This is a very complex slide. But this is the, you know, a, a version of uncomfortable emotions. Like I don't even know how many there. But most of us don't have a lot of um, emotional literacy. Most of us use words like I'm stressed or I'm anxious. That's it. Like that's, that becomes like, that, that's it. We don't actually know all of the words. But the words, the emotions that I see that people mainly use to soothe, guilt, which is why when you make a slip or take your all-terrain vehicle off the path or whatever phrase you want to use it, this is why we say don't feel guilty. Now, again, saying don't feel guilty and not feeling guilty are completely different things, but just recognising that guilt is not a helpful emotion in this. It's likely to make the problem worse. Shame also, again, that idea that you've ashamed of yourself because you keep trying to do it and you're hopeless and you can't do it. Again, really powerful drivers of eating. I would say resentment is another one. Again, we don't talk a lot about resentment. It's a very uncomfortable emotion. 
And the other one that comes up a lot is insignificance. So when people feel like they've not been validated, they're not heard, they're invisible, they feel somebody's made them small. Okay, again, that feeling, it's pretty uncomfortable and we will often use food to eat, to soothe, sorry. So what we wanna do is teach people some other skills. Okay, these are the ones that we teach. There's, um, I would add down the bottom of that, for people with complex trauma, the EMDR is a very powerful um, psychological technique to help with that needs to be done by a trained professional. I, neither Mary or I am trained in, in EMDR. Um, but we, are, we do teach people about diaphragmatic breathing. We teach people tapping, so that's EFT, it's very good. Touch, meditate, so touch is, I mean this is why people love massages, because touch soothes us. What do we do when we've got the toddler that's crying over the cake? We rub their back, we soothe them. We don't feed them the cake, okay? So, <laughs> Meditation, hypnosis, also really powerful tools. Again, this goal achieving, as I said, for many of you, you have lost trust with yourself. You're not sure you're gonna be able to do it. Okay, part of that is you're stuck in all or nothing thinking as I was, I was either doing it perfectly or I wasn't doing it all. Okay, I was either going to the gym 10 times a week, like every day and twice sometimes, or I wasn't going at all. Small structured goals, which our brain will tell you, oh, it's hardly worth doing that, it's so small, I'm not even gonna bother. But what they do is they build trust. And again, I love this picture, this little ladder shows you exactly what happens when you start with small goals and build trust. The more that you build the trust with yourself, again, that beautiful reticular activating system that is filtering will look for all the other things that you're doing. Confidence begets confidence. Now, I've got a couple of people, I know I've gone a bit over time, I'm having a little, I'm having quite fun actually. But um, I just wanted to tell you about a couple of people. So this, uh, these people are de-identified, but these are true stories. So this is a lady called Sue. Now Sue was such a gorgeous woman, type two diabetes, loved low carb, very um, passionate about the desire to do it, but just found that she couldn't do it. And we're talking, we're talking, about what, what her troubles were and it was like a, as soon as again for her it was emotional eating she identified that and we went back into her past so sue grew up in a normal family of a mum dad a brother um, but her parents there was quite a lot of conflict they were quite vocal they would fight quite a bit and when she was about five or six uh, she would get upset and she'd start crying and her dad got really angry at her and he would tell her to stop sniveling stop your whinging you know, grow up. And so she learned a couple of things. She learned that it was unsafe to express herself. And then what she did was she'd sneak into her pantry and grab, because, you know, she was an older, she was a lady in about her 60s. In their pantry, they had uh, tin peaches. It's probably the most processed food they had in there, but she would sneak a tin out and then run out into a garden, hide up in a tree and scoff these peaches until the fighting had finished. So, this took a little while for her to understand what was going on. Again, brain felt unsafe whenever there was conflict and it was trying to make her feel better. That's all it was doing. And it, it was actually doing a pretty good job. It's just that those tools worked for her when she was five, but they're not helpful for her anymore when she's 65. So we needed to teach her new tools. Julie, Again, did our, one of our 12-week programs, and as you know, in the book, there's the red list and the green list. So what happened with her was she looked at the green list and goes, oh, that's nice. And then her brain spent all its time perseverating over the red list. <laughs> and all of a sudden, all it wanted to do was eat red list things. <laughs> it's like, hmm, it's not that helpful. So again, we talked to her about her brain, and for her, she was an ex, ex dieter Restriction was very, prevalent in her mind is something to be scared of because she spent a lot of her years hungry and undernourished. So again, talking to her about reframing restriction in, in, our, in this concept with a low carb lifestyle, it's not deprivation because you're not actually hungry. You're not depriving your body of nutrients. You're not depriving your body of food. But for her, it was also about focusing on the green list. Let's throw away the red list. I said to her, don't even look at it. Take it off your fridge, bloody bin it. 
Interestingly, it, this is common for a number of people, and I, I know you all giggled, so I'm assuming that for some of you it's the same thing. Now, we run a no sugar challenge, and it's little. Again, we do a seven day. Now, seven days is not going to change the world, but it is that first rung in the confidence step. But interestingly enough, for some people, the minute they started the seven day no sugar challenge, they just wanted to eat sugar. Was that right? This isn't that helpful, Mary. What are we going to do? So we've kept the challenge the same. We've just renamed it. It's now called the seven day low carb real food challenge. So again, helping, working with your brain, helping your brain around that reticular activating system to start looking everywhere for low carb real food. Rather than what you can't have, what can you have, of which there is truckloads of stuff. I'm getting to the end. I'm just gonna talk about Dave quickly. So Dave, 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 look, Dave was, Dave was such a gorgeous man. He would come in and he's a sweet tooth. Is that how he described himself? And he could string three or four days together and then he'd just cave. And this is, we, this, we, he repeated this process frequently. And we talked a little bit about what was going on for him. So the first thing was that he was actually addicted to sugar as has come out. So again, teaching him about the physiology of sugar addiction with dopamine receptors, how they're upregulated, and when they don't get their hit, they yell, scream, have a tantrum, behave like the kid in the kitchen. So the thing is though, over time, just like that kid in the kitchen, if the mum had said yes then, then the next time he wanted cake, he would have you know, stuck on the tantrum again until she said yes. So we know that physiologically your dopamine receptors downregulate once you but once you've gone through that initial, you know, hard yakka period to the point where, again, you're then getting your dopamine hit from real food. So a little cognitive reframe that I use for this is that processed food or junk food, whatever you want to call it, steals the joy of real food. And it truly does because you can't taste anything you, if, you're drink, if you're eating a Thai red curry or a Thai green curry, if, if you like Thai food, like when I eat that now, I can taste the lemongrass, I can taste the lime, I can taste it. Before I couldn't taste anything. In fact, I used to hate it because it was always just too hot. But I had been completely blunted by Maltesers. <laughs> <laughs> so again, we just talked to Steve about this, came up with some cognitive reframe him, gave him some coping strategies when his amygdala was and his nucleus, when that toddler brain was having the tantrum, and he made it through. Keep us safe, make us feel better. It's not a bad brain, you just need to work with it. The missing link in lots of programs, lots of, lots of things will give you a meal plan, they'll give you points, it's all action-based. Action-based is important, but it's not the only thing. And in fact, we know, because we see a lot of them, a lot of people have had bariatric surgery. Bariatric surgery is an action-based tool. And unless you go in and do that work on why do you eat, it's, not, it's never gonna work permanently. We see so many people who have considered failed bariatrics, which is just the surgeon says, well, I don't know, I've chopped your stomach out, the rest's up to you. What they didn't do and what they probably should have done was actually assess the reason in the first place as to why, why, why are you eating? So those four points, cognitive reframing, fancy way of saying change your thoughts, emotional regulation, learning to, what to do when you are, you know, heightened, goal achieving to build confidence. And again, I think a supportive community is really helpful. Now. I know I've taken a lot of your time and I thank you so much for listening.